Hey, we're going to begin by looking at Matthew 19. If you want to follow along in this passage, in your insert, that might be helpful as our text today comes from Matthew 19. It says, just then a man came up to Jesus and asked, teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Why do you ask me about what is good, Jesus replied. There is only one who is good. If you want to enter life, keep the commandments. Which ones, he inquired. And Jesus replied, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, honor your father and mother, and love your neighbor as yourself. All these I've kept, the young man said, what do I still lack? Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven, and then come, follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. And then Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I tell you, it is hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished and asked, Who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Peter answered him, We have left everything to follow you. What then will there be for us? And Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or fields for my sake will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last and many who are last will be first. So last week, we we kicked off a new series called Gospel, asking a basic question, what is the gospel? And so last week, we looked at the gospel Jesus himself preached, because if we don't start with the gospel that Jesus preached, we can easily wind up with a gospel that Jesus didn't preach. And so Mark's one-line summary of Jesus' gospel was our text last week, the time is at hand, the kingdom of God has arrived. That's kind of the really short version of the gospel according to Jesus. And as I alluded to last week, the gospel that Jesus preached often sounds different from the gospel we may have heard growing up. And so today we're going to take one more Sunday to kind of get our our minds around the gospel and what it is. And then for several weeks we'll talk about how you live the gospel out. How do you demonstrate it? How do you share it with others? So today we're going to compare and contrast the gospel Jesus preached and some of the most popular summaries of the gospel in the American church today. Dallas Willard wrote, We must do nothing less than a radical rethinking of the Christian concept of salvation. Now in context, he doesn't mean the radical rethinking of the orthodox, historic Christian concept of salvation. He means the latter, modern, popular one that a lot of us grew up with. See, our understanding of the gospel is based on our understanding of salvation itself. What does it mean to be saved? Does it mean go to heaven when you die? Or have your sins justified in the legal court of heaven? Or something else? How you define salvation will determine how you define the gospel and vice versa and will determine the trajectory of your soul. Now, I'll just lay my cards out uh, right away and say that what most Americans may believe about the gospel, it's not necessarily wrong, but it's incomplete and therefore only partially good news. And so we need to make sure that we measure the gospel we preach and live out against the gospel that Jesus preached and lived out. He's the ultimate teacher and the litmus test for the gospel. And Jesus, like we just read, is full of surprises. In verse 16, that opening question from the young man, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? And for those of us who who, who love the gospel, that's like the dream question, right? Like, we hope someone will ask us this question. Like, so, you know, um, Uncle Mark, you know, what one thing must I do to get eternal life? Well, let me tell you, my nephew. Uh, My nephews are going to probably be, are they here today? Yeah, see, but see, there's six. They're probably not going to ask me that question today. 
Just saying. Maybe one day they'll ask it that way. And, you know, and based on my church experience, I know what Jesus is supposed to say here, right? Like, like if, you, if you've been around me, what, what do you think I would say? I would say something like, do? You don't have to do anything. That's religion. That's man earning his way toward God. That's works-based righteousness. That's not the gospel. It, 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 I'm about to do, Jesus would say, I'm about to do all for you on the cross. All you need to do is believe. But does Jesus say that to this guy? No, right? In fact, his reply is kind of like a head scratcher because he tells the man to keep the commandments. Verse 20, all these I've kept, the man says. What do I still lack? Interesting. Jesus doesn't disagree that the man seems to have or may have kept those commandments. And yet both the man and Jesus are aware that there's something more than the commandments. That whatever salvation is, whatever eternal life is, is not less than morality, but a lot more than morality. And then Jesus tells him to sell all his possessions and come follow him. That's not, not what Jesus is supposed to say in my theology and the way I grew up. Jesus is messing with my theology. I think that's kind of funny, but anyway. <laughs> Again, tough, tough crowd this morning. Now here's some context to make sense of Jesus' reply. The man, contrary to popular opinion, is not actually asking, how do I go to heaven when I die? Now, certainly as a first century Jewish man, he would have a concept of life after death with God, but first century Jewish people were waiting on pins and needles for the Messiah, the long-awaited king of Israel and the world, to arrive and usher in the kingdom of God, the reign of God, not only over Israel, but over the whole world and everyone in it. And Jesus is either that Messiah or he's claiming to be that Messiah. And the man is asking, what do I need to do to make sure I'm a part of that kingdom, Jesus? And so part of the problem is that phrase, eternal life. It's not very easy to translate into American English usage. Because when I hear the word eternal life, I hear eternal and I think Life without end, forever and ever. And it is that, but it's more than that, okay? That's not the primary or the only meaning. A growing number of scholars argue that a better translation is the life of the age to come. Brenda, Brenda Klinge writes, eternal life is primarily qualitative rather than quantitative. See, it's more about quality than quantity. And so eternal describes the kind of life that one has in Christ. Case in point, the one time that eternal life is defined in the New Testament is by Jesus himself. It's in John 17, 3. This is what he says. It's in your insert. Now, this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So eternal life in Jesus' mind is knowing the Father and the Son, not knowing just about God, but, but knowing God. You're not like you know, the way I know Alaska. I've never been there, right? I just know about Alaska. But knowing God, like the way I know my wife or my close friends, you know, from personal experience and engagement, it's participating in the life of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So notice that in this story, eternal life in verse 16 the kingdom of heaven in verse 23, the kingdom of God in verse 24, and salvation in verse 25 are all used interchangeably. Kingdom, salvation, eternal life. It really explains why Jesus' primary message in Matthew, Mark, and Luke is the kingdom, but in the Gospel of John and the rest of the New Testament, that theme is takes a backstage to something else. In Paul's writings, his primary message is salvation. John's primary message is eternal life. But here they're all used interchangeably. Those aren't three different messages. They're three different ways of saying the same thing. Kingdom, salvation, eternal life. So could it be that Jesus' view of the gospel and salvation and eternal life is different than maybe a lot of us grew up with? The answer is yes. Okay. So with the rest of our time, 
I'm going to do something. I don't, I don't really like to do it this way, so it's kind of teachy, and I'm really apologetic about that, or sorry about that. But uh, next week, it'll get a little more practical again. But I just think this is really important for us to understand in the church. And so I want to articulate the four most prevalent gospels in the American church today. A couple disclaimers. This, this may sound like it's a critique. That's not really what I'm intending. I wish there was a better way. I'm just trying to compare and contrast. And so please hear me. I'm not saying like these are all wrong and I'm right about everything. Um, some of them are wrong, but really most of them are likely just incomplete pictures of the whole. And it's really taken me like a lifetime to figure this out. And so my heart here is pastoral, and so I just want to pastor you into a life of deeper fellowship and discipleship with Jesus, that you might become more like Jesus each day. And so I think these four Gospels, followed in isolation, stunt spiritual growth. So again, my agenda is not to call out any particular church or tradition or pastors, but to call you to follow Jesus. So whether you agree or disagree with me, with what I'm about to say, that's my goal, okay, for you to know and grow in your knowledge and love of Jesus and to accept all of his good news for your life. So number one, the evangelical gospel, what some people call the John 3.16 gospel. This is kind of a popular level summary, okay, basic summary. You are a sinner going to hell. God loves you. Jesus died on the cross for your sins. If you believe in him, you will go to heaven when you die. Should be pretty familiar. Uh, The preaching of this gospel is usually followed by some version of like the sinner's prayer or an invitation to come forward like an altar call or perhaps in, in, in more recent iterations, I'm noticing, you know, a hand raised and Last week, I saw a church that you could do it by text. I've even said, hey, come see me after the service. I'd love to talk with you. However that looks, there's, there's an invitation, a challenge to make some kind of commitment to Jesus. And this version of the gospel rose to prominence after World War II. It was an attempt to simplify the gospel into an appealing and accessible message for the masses. And so, you know, there's different ways to interpret that. A cynical approach might be like, yeah, they're just trying to get converts. A more gracious interpretation, what I would prefer to say, is that this was a generation far more than our own who took Jesus' call to preach the gospel seriously. And there are some things it does really well. It's, it's called a personal conversion, for instance. It, it, it's like an attempt to, to define the relationship. Have you ever had to define the relationship you know, you're dating someone, it's like, what, you know, are we dating or not? It's basically what you're doing with God when you make a commitment to God. You're no longer just like, hey, I, I come and, and listen and stuff. No, I'm now a Jesus follower. So that's really good with what that does. And this is really needed, especially maybe for those traditions that people are raised in where they baptize infants. Like there needs to be a time where you say yes to Jesus. There are also some issues with this gospel as well. Most notably, there's nothing close to this gospel that Jesus preached himself. And so if you search for this formulation in the gospels, you won't find it. And the problem is, isn't that it's wrong, but it's nowhere close to the full picture. See, salvation for Jesus isn't getting you into heaven, but getting heaven into you. It's not about going up there, but having it come down here. It's not just about a transaction, but transformation. And it's not just about the transformation of an individual person, but of an entire community. It's not just about what God wants to do for us, but what God wants to do in us and then through us. It's not just about what happens when we die, but what happens while we're still alive. It's not just about going to church after you're saved, but being baptized into the family of God. So do you see the problem? There's no call to discipleship, to growing more like Jesus. Because you just get your get-out-of-hell-free card and you're good to go, right? Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so, and I can do whatever I want now. Is kind of the implication that some people who use this gospel give. It's like an optional add-on for those who are really into it, rather than the pathway forward with God. And so this gospel can lead to a salvation by a kind of minimum entrance exam, or requirement, I should say, a minimum entrance requirement. Like when people in this vein ask, hey, do you think if, you know, 
name a celebrity who's been in the news, do you think so-and-so saved? What they're really asking is, did they meet the minimum requirements to get into heaven when they die? But is that what salvation is? How many of you think about the minimum requirements to maintain a healthy relationship? I don't think anybody does. Like, our discipleship with Jesus is more like the biblical metaphor of marriage. So just imagine if I said to Jennifer, what are the minimal requirements you need from me to stay legally married to you? How do you think that would go over? Thank you. And, and it shouldn't, right? It shouldn't. And I'd be missing the entire point of what marriage is. Like marriage is a legal contract, you know, it's a legal status. But that's peripheral. That's not the center of what marriage is about. It's a relational covenant. So in the same way, salvation by Jesus' definition is knowing God, participating in the inner life of the Trinity for the healing of your soul. You see, you have to map an idea like the forgiveness of sin. You have, you have to map that onto something larger, a larger story. And that's what Paul does in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you which you received and on which you have taken your stand, by this gospel you're saved. If you hold firmly to the word, I preach to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. And that's his summary. But notice that important, that important phrase, according to the scriptures. It's used twice here by Paul, meaning that the backstory to the forgiveness of sins and salvation is the scriptures, which is Paul's shorthand way in that era of saying the story of the Old Testament. I mean, this includes the fall of humanity into sin, choosing to go our way and self-rule rather than going God's way and submitting to his leadership for our lives. I mean, that word sin means to miss the mark. But that kind of begs the question, what's the mark? Like, is the mark perfection? Is the mark going to heaven when we die? Uh, what if the mark is union with God? Or what if it's the healing of your soul? What if it's becoming a person of agape love? Like, if any of this is true, then the evangelical gospel is an inadequate foundation upon which to build a life of discipleship conducive to transformation your whole life. Number two, the Reformed gospel. At a popular level, it sounds like this. God is perfect, holy, just God, both of love and wrath. You are morally guilty before him. God's demands must be kept. You can't do it. So Jesus did it for you on the cross. And so this equates the preaching of the gospel with the preaching of a cluster of reformed doctrines, mainly justification, which is the belief that we are saved only by our faith in Jesus Christ through grace, not by any good works. Like you can't earn it. It's all given to you by God. You just have to accept it by faith. And as Al Mohler uh, president of the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary said in Louisville, he says, justification by faith alone is not one doctrine among others or one way of describing the gospel. It is the gospel. And so to clarify, again, I agree with him that justification is a biblical doctrine. It's in the New Testament, but it's not used nearly as much as people think. Jesus only uses it one time in all four Gospels, Luke chapter 18. It's used more by Paul, but really primarily in two letters, Galatians and Romans. He refers to it once in Philippians and 1 Corinthians, and not at all in the rest of his letters. And it's not used once by John or Peter or the other New Testament authors, which is pretty strange if it is the Gospel. See, in the Reformed view, justification means that Jesus has earned merit on our behalf, through living a sinless life that we never could, and in the heavenly courtroom of a just God, he's imputed, he's received sin from us and given us Jesus' righteousness. And so we're declared righteous in God's eyes, not by anything we've done. See 2 Corinthians 
Now, I deeply respect Reformed theologians. They were my seminary professors. And similar to the evangelical gospel, it's not so much that it's wrong. I agree with everything I've said, but more that it's just too small. The positive, is, the positive thing is they emphasize the cross. For, for Paul, the cross is more than the literal death on the cross, but all of who Jesus is. A Reformed theology also has a sophisticated view of moral guilt, which our generation is sorely lacking. It has a means of dealing with that guilt, which our generation is also lacking. It's also not scared to talk about God's wrath, which is throughout Scripture. And it rightly sees God's wrath as an expression of his love, kind of like the fierceness of a parent toward a wayward child, you know, emotionally, internally offended, but deeply invested in their good which is better than our modern definition of love as a, as a lazy tolerance, which is okay with whatever as long as possible, as long as people are, are basically nice. Nonetheless, there are some issues with this gospel. Mainly, you're hard-pressed to find Jesus use it. He only talks about it one time. And Jesus never goes around criticizing good works. And so the main problem, again, is discipleship living with Jesus day by day for the rest of your life. This interpretation of justification defines good works as self-effort in general, and then it equates self-effort with earning. See, grace isn't opposed to effort. Grace is only opposed to earning. So don't confuse those two ideas. The great danger with this gospel is that it can sabotage our discipleship because following Jesus is something we do. And if we're told constantly that it's not about what we do, but what about what God has done for us, then people can develop a passive form of Christian spirituality that has a high view of Christ, that's good, but a low view of becoming more like Christ, which leads to doing good things. And so like the evangelical gospel with its, you know, just raise your hand to Jesus to get out of hell ethic, this gospel also leads to a consumer Christianity with its, well, Jesus did it all, so you don't have to do anything mindset. Number three, the prosperity gospel. The prosperity gospel, it's also called health and wealth, a word of faith. It's a relative newcomer on the scene in the last century. It's a religious belief among Protestant Christians that financial blessing and physical well-being are always the will of God for them. And so the atonement, you know, Jesus' death includes the alleviation of sickness and poverty, which, is our, which, which are curses that can be broken by your faith. And that's to be achieved by donations of money, thank you, and visualization. And so the popular version sounds like this. God loves you. You are made in his image. Through the death and resurrection of Jesus, he won the victory. And by your inheritance, you can have victory over sickness, poverty, and failure. I mean, buckle up, buddy. The best is yet to come, and your breakthrough is on the way if you just have enough faith. Now, the hard version of this is just plain bad and not biblical at all. If you just think of the worst that televangelism has produced over the many decades, it's been widely discredited but it's been replaced by a softer version that's more mainstream in our culture. It's more therapeutic and focused on principles for emotional and relational help and material success. Tons of celebrities are into this. A study show that 17% of Americans identify with the prosperity gospel. Half of churches, over 10,000 people, preach the prosperity gospel, and those who preach it often gain fabulous wealth. I probably should rethink my, 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 what we should do here. Uh, the positive parts of this gospel is its emphasis on a loving God who is with you even through hardship. It is faith that God can do miracles. A prosperity gospel churches often start a lot of social services and help the poor. They've been on the forefront of multi-ethnic churches from the beginning. So there's a lot of good there. But what's wrong is that it's simply not the gospel that Jesus preached. And really, it's the opposite of the life that Jesus lived. Like, it sets people up for disillusionment. You know, the best is yet to come. Tell that to Paul and the apostles and the millions of Christian martyrs down through the centuries and who still suffer in countries around the world. 
Now, if by, by best, you know, you mean becoming a person more like Jesus, primarily through suffering, and yet to come, you mean not in this life, but in the life to come, well, then that statement's 100% true. But that's not what they mean. Health and wealth in this life is how they define it, and if you don't have it, your faith is inadequate. And so you're inadequate. And that's heresy. That is not grounded in reality or in Jesus or anywhere really in the scriptures. Number four, the social gospel. That's the one I'm most hard on, sorry. The social gospel, it's also known as the liberation gospel. The liberation gospel. This gospel sees all of human history as a struggle of power between the oppressed and the oppressor and views most relationships through power dynamics. In this framework, it sounds something like this. Jesus was a political revolutionary to liberate the poor and marginalized from the hierarchy of oppression. He was killed as a threat to the status quo of the empire, but he inaugurated a kingdom of peace and justice and equality, and Jesus is on the march now, as he was then, to stand up against those who abuse power and to liberate the poor and everyone else on the margins. The church's role is essentially an activist role to move America toward a progressive and really socialist political model. Now, right now, this is probably the most influential gospel in our Disciples of Christ tradition at the national level. And let me just point out what I really like about this view. For starters, it uses the language of kingdom and understands that the kingdom isn't only about going to heaven, but having the heaven, you know, heaven, heaven come to us. It understands that you can't separate the preaching of the gospel from the demonstration of the gospel. It has a sophisticated view of individual and institutional sin, something evangelicals struggle to understand. I love its emphasis on the dignity of all people, its courage to call out racism and sexism and classism, even in the church. Like, it's a great reminder how Jesus radically subverted the world's models of power. But again, there are all sorts of problems with this gospel. For starters, if the kingdom was primarily political, number one, why didn't Jesus go to Rome? Why did he stay in Galilee? In fact, he doesn't even spend much time in Jerusalem. Number two, Jesus lived in a politically loaded time. His approach has been called by scholars as intentional indifference simply refused to engage in the political activism of his day. That's why he said, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. Number three, whatever Jesus was, he simply was not a progressive by the current moral definition of the word as it relates to personhood and sexuality. I mean, Jesus' teaching on sexuality are arguably the most conservative of any teacher in Scripture. He's a celibate Jewish rabbi. One of the main problems with the social gospel is its long-running compromise with theological truth. Uh, Walter Rauschenbusch, the pastor who coined the phrase social gospel, he was one of the forerunners who called out social evils like child labor. So he, he's a hero in many ways for making some changes in our culture. But sadly, Rauschenbusch, in his redefinition of the gospel, decided to jettison the atonement, the Bible is scripture, and that Jesus literally rose from the dead. So again, the main problem here is that this gospel doesn't require discipleship to Jesus at a holistic level because it equates discipleship with political activism. Lecture over. Thank you for listening. Thank you for your patience. Closing thoughts really quickly. Which of the four gospels do you find yourself believing or leaning into the most? And I'm going to guess that most of us here would be in the first two. And some who start there, many people who I talk to who've left the church started one or two and they move to three or four and then ultimately they find out those distortions don't work either and they leave the church altogether. Because we need to rediscover Jesus' gospel. Every generation has to do that. Our children and grandchildren will have to do the hard work to read and think and go to the source that is Jesus and disentangle the gospel from its cultural wrappings. So this week I recommend that you like write down your simple definition of the gospel. 
I mean, you can use a combination of these and hopefully something of what Jesus might have taught. And then read one of the Gospels. You know, Mark's the shortest. You can get through that quickest. And let Jesus shape your definition. Because all of us base our lives on some kind of a gospel or what we put our hope in, what we think is good news to us. And so who or what are you looking to for salvation and fullness of life? The gospel you live in is the gospel that you live out. And so next week, we'll move from definitions and this boring stuff probably to most of you to practical ways we can actually proclaim and live out and demonstrate the gospel in our everyday lives. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for Jesus and the word given to us in the scriptures. Lord, we, we want to model our life after him, what he taught, what his apostles taught, and not just maybe what we heard growing up. And as much, as much value as there is to these gospels that we've talked about, these four, uh, not one of them captures everything about your kingdom. And so, Lord, we just want to submit to your word with our lives that over time we would begin to, to put pieces to the puzzle uh, together and to see the full picture, not just one part, as important as those parts are. We want to see all the good news that you have for our life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.